Okay, hello everyone and welcome to day three of ENO's Transit Project Delivery Symposium. My name is Brianne Eby. I am a senior policy analyst here at ENO and one of the co-authors of our report. And I'm so excited to welcome you all to this session, um, which is called Issues and Best Practices in Environmental Permitting. I know this is a topic that's come up in um, casual discussion and on panels um, it really, every panel that I've sat in um, on the, the prior days leading up to today. So I, th I think we'll have a, a really robust discussion with this panel and, and with the audience at the end of this hour long session. Um, just so you know, after uh, today's session, there is an optional networking room that will be available via Zoom. Hopefully some of you have attended those and, and gotten something out of that experience so far. Just a really casual um, way for you all to interact with the panelists, um, the ENO staff, and, and other attendees of, of this conference. So feel free to attend that right after today's session. All of the sessions will be recorded and posted, so you can go back and access the sessions that you were unable to attend, particularly for the other concurrent sessions that are happening um, simultaneous to this one. And you can also access all of the sessions on the agenda tab on the left of your screen on, on Socio. So if you want to um, attend any others as well, you can go there. After we end this session, you'll be prompted to rate it and to evaluate the panel. And just a reminder, your feedback is so valuable valuable to us. So please take the time to offer some comments and rate each of these sessions. Um, it should be a pretty quick process. And um, just one final reminder, at any point during the discussion, you can enter questions into the chat. So we will have about 15 minutes or so for audience Q&A at the end of this discussion, but you can answer or um, uh, pose any questions at any point and, and we'll bring those into the discussion at the end. So with that, uh, we have a, a, a large panel today, so I wanna get right into introducing folks. Um, so I'll start with Christy Goldfuss, the Senior Vice President of Energy and Environment Policy at the Center for American Progress. Christy's also the former Managing Director of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Next, we have Felicia James, the Associate Administrator for Planning and Environment at the Federal Transit Administration. She's followed by Ethan Elkind, the Director of Clim the Climate Program at the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment at the University of California, Berkeley. He's followed by Amanda Baxter, the Vice President of Operations in North America for Transurban. And finally, we have Paul May, the Executive Vice President of Project Implementation for the York Region Rapid Transit Corporation. So I'm going to um, start by having each of these folks um, introduce themselves in, in uh, about a minute or so. Just what, you know, what is your history and experience with this topic of environmental permitting? Um, so let's start with Christy and we'll, we'll go in order. I'll, I'll introduce each of you again, but Christy, let's kick it off with you. Brianne, thanks for having me. And thanks to Eno for this topic because it's crucially important and hopefully in the coming years, we'll have an opportunity to uh, really have a dramatic build out of our infrastructure here in the United States. So this discussion is incredibly timely. So I come to this discussion from several different seats. I worked at the National Park Service as the deputy director for a period of time during the Obama administration, where I kind of had this firsthand experience on uh, how agencies inside the federal government can stymie projects. And when there is disagreement between two agencies and not a real drive from the top out of the secretary's office or out of the White House to resolve those differences, they just sit on people's desk for months and months and months. And there needs to be a motivation inside the government to actually unstick those. Then I went to the Council on Environmental Quality, which is, of course, responsible for implementing the National Environmental Policy Act. So we did a lot of community engagement and a lot of work around how climate works as part of NEPA. But I was also there for the creation of the Federal Permitting Steering Committee, uh, which was implemented through FAST 41, a law that really tried to get at what are the government's issues around federal permitting. And in the establishment of the Federal Permitting Council and a dashboard that really is just a tool to see where the hangups are in the federal government, it just became obvious that across the board, pretty much no matter what agency you're talking about, we're looking at antiquated tools, we're looking at a whole host of other issues that really make project delivery times difficult. So this is not really a political issue because every single administration tries to tackle it. And I know we'll get into challenges later, but uh, thank you again for having me. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next we'll move on to Associate Administrator James. 
Um, yes, well, thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank the Eno Center for Transportation for taking on this effort of analyzing trends in public transit project delivery. This is a topic that is comprehensive in its, in its number of stakeholders, as well as in its variables that impact it. Um, I, I'll just share, um, I come from, from this topic uh, with the experience starting at the State Highway Administration in Maryland, uh, where I got my taste of environment and leading projects through project delivery, um, and as well as engaging in the early in the transportation planning process. Um, I spent also spent the last uh, five years prior to joining FTA with the Federal Highway Administration, specifically working in the and on the federal side of things in doing implementing regulation and guidance development at the national level. Um, so I do bring to the table, not only just the direct project experience, but also um, the federal experience as well. And here in my role currently as AA uh, within FTA, I oversee not just the environmental review process uh, and what we le push out from a national perspective in, in public transit, but also how it ties into transportation planning um, and, and then leading into a project delivery through our capital investment grant program. So I get to really see the life um, of a project as it, it ebbs and flows through the various stages want, uh, to make it to construction. So thank you. Excellent. Um, I think we have Ethan next. All right. Hi, and uh, thank you, Brianne, and everyone at Eno for organizing this. It's been a great conference so far, and I'm looking forward to hearing more on uh, on this particular topic. And uh, in terms of um, my background on environmental permitting, so most of my work has been focused on California and the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, it started with some research I did actually in law school, looking at the impact of uh, CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act exemptions on uh, affordable housing. Uh, and really trying to tease out what some of the uh, you know, quantifiable impacts were of, of CEQA on housing production. Later, I wrote a book on the history of LA's metro rail system and uh, environmental review definitely came into play as that system rolled out starting in the 1980s. And more recently, we've done some uh, case study work at uh, the Center for Law, Energy and the Environment at UC Berkeley Law, where I direct the climate program. Uh, we've been focusing on uh, transit case studies, looking again at how environmental permitting has affected some recent rail projects in California, including high-speed rail. Uh, we're also doing some work to help the state implement its transition on transportation impacts analysis to vehicle miles traveled. So no longer is uh, California under the California Environmental Quality Act measuring impacts on transportation by how much it's delaying automobile traffic and more about reducing vehicle miles traveled overall. So I could talk more about that as we uh, launch into the panel. Thanks. Excellent, Amanda. Uh, thank you again and, and really happy to be um, a part of this panel and just everyone participating on this panel. Um, I'm currently uh, working um, at Transurban leading the operations for North America. However, my intersection with NEPA started back in the 90s um, outside of transportation where I was part of the big wireless boom. Uh, working on getting the federal communications NEPA regulations in place, which allowed me to work very closely with the CEQ at the time. And then in the early 2000s, I found myself uh, working at the Virginia Department of Transportation as a NEPA specialist and, and transferring that uh, expertise into transportation. Uh, following that, I became a consultant for the balance of probably a decade or so. Uh, where I had the opportunity to not only work on uh, DOT surface transportation, but also I did a lot of work in Maryland, working on the Purple Line and other transit projects leading NEPA efforts, only to be invited back to the Virginia Department of Transportation again to work for them, implementing a toll road that many of you all might know, the 66 inside the Beltway, that has a large transit component where it's operated by the state and all the money goes to fund transit along that corridor during rush hour. And now here at Transurban, as I lead operations, I have the intersection of the P3 world of where we operate um, and maintain the roadway. We provide financing through our concessions back to government to allow for transit funding along our corridors and monitor that success. So I'm really happy to be a part of this panel today. Excellent. And finally, Paul, I'll have you uh, introduce yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Brianne, and thanks for inviting me to this uh, panel session. I guess I'm the, the sole foreigner on, on this panel, uh, the sole Canadian. Uh, York Region, uh, for those who probably haven't heard of it, um, 
is part of the greater Toronto area here in Ontario. Uh, we're the suburban area immediately to the north of the city of Toronto. Um, on our own, we're, we have a population of 1.2 million and we're uh, plan to grow to about 2 million over the next uh, 30 years or so. Um, so it's a rapidly urbanizing uh, region, rapidly developing. Uh, right now it's sort of a suburban area of the city of Toronto, but we are creating our own urban centers uh, in our own right. Um, so along with that, we've developed a rapid transit uh, network and plan that uh, we've been implementing for the past 20 years or so. Um, I've been involved in that implementation throughout. Uh, so far, we've, uh, we've built and completed uh, 34 kilometers of bus rapid transit on dedicated lanes in the medians of uh, arterial roads um, within York Region. And we also participated in the first subway extension of the City of Toronto subway system that ventured beyond the City of Toronto borders um, into York Region. So we had a, a very um, a key role in that. Uh, for the future, there's one more subway extension to go from the City of Toronto into York Region, uh, as well as about another 75 kilometers of uh, BRT to complete our network over the next uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, so I've been very actively involved in the environmental process for all of those projects as a proponent um, through all steps of uh, their implementation. Okay, great. Thank you for those introductions. That'll hopefully help give folks a sense of, of where you all are coming from on this topic. Um, so I'd, I'd like to go in that order again and allow you all to dig a little bit deeper into um, some of your, your really valuable experience. And um, so Christy, we'll start with you. I know you said um, you have firsthand experience on how agencies can stymie projects. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges as you see them with environmental permitting and, and the reform process, as well as some of the, um, the promising uh, policies or proposals or, or strategies for dealing with some of those challenges? Absolutely. I think inconsistency is what we heard time and time again, even within agencies. So whether you're going to the Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service getting very different interpretation of the same rules. And then even within an agency going to a different region and having a different office interpret the rules in a different way. So not, not knowing what to expect. I think the challenge with the federal government to state the obvious for everyone here is it is a massive, massive organization. And the project development and the commitment to actually getting these enormous projects done spans usually well beyond different administrations. And without any kind of transparency to see who's holding it up, I mean, you know, for example, if you're when I was at the Park Service, there were issues around bighorn sheep and whether or not there was going to be the viability for the bighorn sheep to cross uh, the roadway that was being contemplated. And Park Service just didn't want to deal with it. So there was periods of time where it just was like nobody was forcing a solution. Uh, which was one of the reasons I became really an evangelist for the Federal Permitting Steering Council, because that is tied to the president, the executive director. Currently is Christine Harada, who just came into the position with the Biden administration, but has a background in large military project development. Um, they're able to be accountable at a level that is even above the cabinet. And it is just the simple act of someone out of the White House going to a deputy secretary or going to a, a bureau director and asking why a question is not getting resolved that can start to move things. And the dashboard that has been out there now for several years was a huge step in showing and some transparency. I say huge step, but this really, we have a long way to go to see uh, the project times come down to a level that I think people would be comfortable that we can do the build out that we need to do in this country, for example, around renewable energy. So I think we started to put in place uh, some of those tools through the Federal Permitting Council, which really can push and has a high level participants from each of the agencies and can make sure that there is resolution, dispute resolution. Uh, but that has to be empowered and really driven out of the West Wing, I would say, in terms of really identifying which projects need to get done and on what time frame. So at a government level, that gives you some more um, insight into how to drive it down. Now, if there aren't people in the positions to get to do the work, 
you can't make them go faster. Nothing doesn't go faster. So one of the huge challenges we've seen over the past um, decade is a real uh, lack of personnel who are focused on environmental review. And that in general is always going to slow slow things down. So given where the government is at this current moment, um, hopefully they'll be able to staff in positions and staff effectively to really kind of uh, address what will hopefully be a huge infrastructure bill that gets over the finish line in the, in the near future. Excellent. Uh, let's move on to Administrator James. What about from the, the FTA's perspective? What do you see as some of the, the key challenges and um, the ways that, that you all think might be effective to address them? Well, um, I think, you know, the report that you all uh, put together identified that complex issues constitute complex solutions, particularly for the type of projects we're talking about. And, and a lot of times it's not just from a from a transit industry perspective, but it may involve if it's a multimodal project, it may involve coordination with across modes within the department as well as other federal agencies throughout that process. But from our perspective, we do have several big issues that are currently impacting how we do business, um, how we will continue to do business going forward in this space. One of them is the CEQ rulemakings um, that are currently underway. As many, as many people who are who live and breathe the environmental review process and what's happening in, in, and in the know here in the United States, the Council on Environmental Quality 2020 NEPA regulation and the upcoming phased rulemakings related to those updates um, do have an impact for on what, from an FTA perspective, we have joint uh, regulations with the Federal Highway Administration. And so with those impending changes that will come from that level uh, of re um, regulation updates, that then therefore re will require FTA to work with Federal Highway to update Part 771 of our regulations that essentially set the stage for how we make process changes and improvements, uh, particularly uh, because we, we all know we've been streamlining, accelerating, advancing the environmental review process probably for, for a long time. I know I, when I entered into the space back in the early 2000s, that was the, that was the, the space we were in at that point in time. Um, and we continue to continue to do that. Um, the other thing I'll note is reauthorization. Um, as many folks know, we're in that space uh, within the country to right now where we're awaiting reauthorization of the FAST Act um, or a, a revised bill to come out. But this is something that, you know, within the federal government, within FTA, we are constantly paying attention to because this is a space that we traditionally are in every several years. Um, and, and within reauthorization, um, that then proposes also additional changes to our environmental statute authority, such as codifying elements of um, one federal decision that was was put out years ago, uh, several years ago. Um, that's how uh, the the federal permitting dashboard that Christy mentioned. That's how that got stood up was through um, through reauthorization, and so that we will then have to take those things things into account as we move forward, um, as well as the implementation of new executive orders. Um, as many for the folks uh, here within the United States. You're probably aware of the number of executive orders that require a whole of government approach in the areas of climate, environmental justice, equity, and Justice 40. Uh, these topics span uh, across not just environmental reviews, but also the planning process and throughout the project, excuse me, the project delivery process of a project. Um, and it also impacts beyond, goes, uh, makes an impact beyond uh, across FTAs, all of FTAs programs. And so how do we incorporate that and then move forward in impl implementing that? Um, we continue to await uh, CEQ's updated greenhouse gas guidance uh, and the changes that will come from that, as well as their, their uh, they are intending to also update their environmental justice executive order. Um, so those are some of the challenges that FTA is currently working through and continuing to face as we uh, look to uh, continue to streamline and accelerate our program. Um, to the second half of your question on promising uh, policies and proposals or programs that may help with those challenges. One thing I will know is back in June, uh, FTA instituted our Sustainable Transit for Healthy Planet Climate Challenge. Um, this has enabled us to assist transit agencies with the development of their climate action plans through technical assistance opportunities that we weren't previously doing. 
Um, at this point in time, as of today, we have more than 100 transit agencies that have signed up for that challenge. And I think that will help in moving um, moving us in the space on the on, um, to accelerate and advance in the climate uh, change greenhouse gas reduction space that is, is definitely a focus of this administration. Um, as well as I'll also note on, on the electrification side of things, we're aware that public transportation produced 12 million metric tons of CO2 emissions in 2018. But it's important to note that in addition to that, that prevented 75 million metric tons of CO2 emissions from entering into the atmosphere. And so with that, we are aware that electric electrification of our fleet can positively strengthen these numbers even more as we continue to see uh, strides being made um, in, in, in converting our bus uh, and, uh, and other vehicles uh, into, in the, into that electric space. Um, and we continue to, to have and are making great strides in learning more about the challenges the transit agencies are facing in that space and how we can then assist them in alleviating some of the challenges as they look to electrify um, the majority, if not all, of their fleet. Um, the other thing I'll note is that FTA continues to look for opportunities for lowering vehicle um, miles traveled via mode shift, because that's where we feel like we, we will see the biggest reduction in emissions reductions. Um, and then back to the whole of government approach, uh, that's going to be essential to accomplish all of these things. We have ramped up and continue to increase our collaboration, not just within the department, but also um, with agencies across federal government. Um, because for um, on for things like the federal permitting dashboard, that that transparency did force us to have to have constant communications, not just within the Department of Transportation on the advancing of those major projects, but also with our federal partners that either have to provide permits or have comments as the projects continue to advance through the environmental review process. Mm -hmm. So um, we we have leaned into the, that opportunity um, and leaned into those collaborative tools that have helped facilitate uh, a more engaging process. And I think this is, this is a time where we'll be able to really leverage that even more as additional changes come out, whether through reauthorization or from CEQ regulation updates. Sure. Thank yeah, you. I think the, the collaboration uh, piece is something I'd love to get into a little bit more if we have time in, in a moment. Um, let's let's have Ethan, I would love to have your perspective on, um, you mentioned having experience with CEQ and, um, you know, some of the, the um, uh, progress that's been made with with um, assessments there. Can you talk about the, the way that you see um, some of the challenges and, and solutions in California? Sure. Yeah. And so I've just got to add an A to CEQ to make it CEQA because uh, that's the California version of, of NEPA. And we focus on uh, on climate friendly projects and how to deploy more climate friendly infrastructure. So that would be everything from bike lanes to transit uh, and, of course, high speed rail. But also we've looked at other uh, climate friendly projects like renewable energy installations and uh, apartment buildings near transit. And when you think of the challenges associated with environmental review, it's really twofold. So you know, at one level, these are process statutes, right? They're not designed uh, to, to stop or kill a project. They're designed to you know, increase public participation and assess impacts in advance. And then in California's case with CEQA, it's about mitigating any impacts uh, where feasible, uh, significant impacts. Uh, but the challenge is, one, is that you see a lot of lawsuits, uh, which can add to project costs and delay um, and sometimes lead to over-designing of projects or concessions that limit the effectiveness of the project. And I think the litigation gets a fair amount of attention, but I think there's a second piece in terms of the challenges with environmental review that may get overlooked, which is the threat of litigation. It's not the litigation itself, but that people are acting in defensive ways in advance to try to avoid a lawsuit. And, you know, at one level you might say, well, that's good. You know, if there's a lawsuit, then that means there's some deficiency. But too often what you see is that the lawsuits are filed by very narrow interests that may not necessarily be about a better environmental outcome, but about trying to expose a deficiency in what can sometimes be a phone book sized environmental review document, or even more multiple phone books in some cases, uh, you know, just to kind of give you a visual of, uh, of how it, you know, deep and intensive this, uh, the disclosures have to be in terms of the environmental analysis. And so it becomes easy to kind of pick apart a flaw there. And so you, in California, for example, you see rival businesses suing 
um, you see a lot of neighborhood groups suing or threatening to sue and then getting, uh, you know, essentially cash contributions from, from developers of certain projects. That's more on the private sector side. Um, but those are the big challenges. It's the defensive siting and, and defensive design and also the lawsuits themselves that can effectively kill some projects. I mean, probably the worst case uh, that I've heard on the transit side is California's um, uh, bus rapid transit project down Van Ness. Uh, a street in uh, San Francisco, which was approved by voters in 2003, still under construction today, and in part because it kicked off a multi-year environmental review process simply because the bus rapid transit lane was going to slow up traffic at a couple key intersections along Van Ness. Uh, so that is kind of a worst case scenario when you have a climate friendly project that is penalized for inconveniencing automobiles. Uh, so to get to your second part of your question about how we would reform this, I, I think ultimately we have to keep in mind that environmental review is critical. We want to encourage public participation. We want to encourage decision makers to assess impacts in advance and mitigate where feasible and explore alternatives as well. So we want to capture all of that. But when it comes to climate friendly, environmentally beneficial projects, I think there are two areas of reform that we really want to focus on. And one is streamlining. So figuring out what are the impacts that we really you know, should be looking at. But when it's something like transit, you know, we know it's got a lot of environmental good baked into it. So let's focus on those areas of impacts where it really makes sense from a community uh, participant uh, participation standpoint or to, you know, better the project. So even with things like greenhouse gas emissions, you know, Felicia just mentioned electrifying fleets. Maybe we can do ways or think about ways to mitigate uh, where the electricity might come from or how much electricity a, a project might need. So even when you see what might sound at the surface like an incredibly environmentally beneficial project, there often are ways to mitigate if we do that analysis in advance. But we just don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and we don't want to drag these projects on. So the second piece of it, in addition to the streamlining, would be focusing on fast tracking the review in certain cases. And we have some good precedents for this and examples of these reforms in California. So that bus rapid transit example I gave where it slowed down traffic and therefore had to do an environmental impact report, we've actually reformed that analysis in California. We're now looking at vehicle miles traveled impacts instead of auto delay, as I mentioned. So that's a reform that I think is a, is a good way to not only streamline analysis because projects that are in areas with already low vehicle miles traveled are essentially exempt now from that impact analysis. But uh, it's also a way to reframe it to sort of modernize it, because really what we care about is not so much traffic at a particular intersection. We care about overall driving miles throughout a region. And then we have examples of fast tracking uh, environmental review. We had a, a law that passed um, about 10 years ago now called AB 900, since been extended. And for certain projects that are that meet critical environmental metrics, things like greenhouse gas emissions, vehicle miles traveled, et cetera, they qualify uh, with other some other criteria involved. They can qualify for fast-tracked judicial review of any lawsuit over the environmental review documentation. And so it's limited to a 270-day uh, litigation timeline and appellate court review. And that kind of thing can also, for certain really meritorious, high-priority, climate-friendly projects, can help uh, expedite the process. So I would say when it comes to environmental review, it's kind of an amend it, don't end it type approach. Uh, some projects we may want to completely exempt that are really no brainers, you know, maybe a bike lane kind of thing. We've, we've done that in California as well um, for certain projects for a certain amount of time, but also the streamlining and the fast track review. Okay, thanks, Ethan. And sorry to miss my misspoke earlier. It's kind of a tongue twister to have both CEQA and CEQ on, kind of represented on the same panel here. Um, Amanda, I'll move on to you next. So as you mentioned, you've had um, you know years of experience um, at really different you know levels of government on different um, uh, modes of transportation and, and even outside of the context of transportation. What do you see as some of the key challenges and uh, potential promising reforms here? Uh, sure. You know, as a person who has sat in CQ's offices, offices, but I've also stood over a, a hole listening to a bunch of wetland scientists argue about how much water was in it. I think I think everything in between I've experienced. Um, so, you know, where where to start? I think the first thing, um, and you know, just to describe to to those that might not be familiar with transurban. You know, we are a, a private entity that operates a public road on public permit that we've actually built and we finance and we maintain it. 
Um, so that's the seat I, I sit in now and it's a public private partnership. So I just want to explain that more broadly. So from where I sit today, you know, a lot that um, from an environmental review perspective, our whole role in this is a, about a risk transfer. So a lot of our projects go through, or all of our projects go through an extensive environmental review, NEPA, um, and then moving on to uh, uh, our, our firm that has to actually construct and implement it, and that tr risk is transferred to us. So we really pick up the environmental decision and, and push it forward from there. Now, where I think things can be um, done better is really from the planning perspective of what actually should be implemented as an alternative. I think oftentimes in one of the particular projects we're working on now, there's a whole variety of alternatives that people look at where they're actually trying to take a surface transportation solution and compare it to fixed rail um, in the same footprint. And that's where I think things get tricky. Um, and, and we need to do a better job even on, on the, um, on our side of things in a managed lane concept to kind of better underscore the power of our managed lanes, the power of the bus, the power of moving more people more effectively. Um, and in that world has not come together. So we usually come and we attack these projects as like the traditional, you know, idea planning. And then you sit in certain offices and, and march them through this whole process. And then in the meantime, you know, there's seven other different alternatives being thrown out there, but where, where you're really, you've got a footprint. Most of what we've done so far has been fairly urbanized. I have done projects, you know, up in, you know, Oregon, Washington state, that totally different animal where, you know, it's, you have all the space in the world, but here in the DC area, it's very urbanized. And, you know, there's only so much, you know, room we have to do things anyway. So we should be really focused on the footprint. But when I'm when I'm sitting in a room trying to get compliance with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, and they have 30 days to review something, but my meeting a week from now is with the National Park Service, and they have 30 days to review something, and then my meeting next week is actually with the Corps of Engineers, and they're going to do 30 days to review something, but all my meetings were like a week apart. So now I've already started to, to start spacing out. So we can talk about one federal decision all we want, but depending on how quickly and the amount of people you can get in front of everyone at the same time, everyone has their own individual review periods. So you really are subject to their own processes. So how do you combine that all into one? I can't go to the park service and say, well, I've already told you know, the Corps of Engineers this two weeks ago, you know, can you truncate your time? They're certainly not going to have the time to do that. And and then once you collect all their comments, then that's where you have opposing views on how things should be implemented. And it gets very, very tricky. And guess what? Then you have to go back and re-coordinate based on their comments and they get a 30 day review and a 30 day review. And, and, and then it just keeps snowballing and keeps going. And then the, the Trojan horse of like another alternative gets thrown into the mix. And then you're going back through the 30 day review, the 30 day review. So you can probably tell I've done this a lot um, where we, we've just kept going through these circles. And so when one federal decision was made, and I think that it was a, a great first step, but it was very, my comment to this report was it was a very top down, whereas, you know, it's the, the really the process and the review of all these individual types of regulations and, and federal law, like we haven't even talked about Section 4F of, of the Transportation Act and that, you know, has has more teeth in court almost than NEPA. But when you start really individually unpacking this, you can, you can put it at the top as long as you want to get something done in two years or one year or whatever, but it's all of the groundwork beneath it and the resourcing. And then what happens in, in our world and where I sit now in a public-private partnership, as we have to go build this, the risk is transferred to us. So if we value engineer something that we feel is more streamlined or more effective for the network, we take the risk to have to go start that review process all over again. And I think it really gets it really gets um, challenging for us to take on that risk, but then the actual state owns the relationship with the federal government. So it's a very different dynamic. 
um, in, in, in my world. And I, and I think I really want to jump on something also that Ethan said about just the streamlining piece of it. I do think that there's better ways that we can streamline some of this coordination and like very up front, front front through like pre NEPA or whatever, just really get the noise out of the room about comparing, comparing alternatives that don't even match to one another and really just getting rid of that noise and moving forward with something that is palatable because what ends up happening is it becomes very disingenuous with the public where, you know, you allow for political reasons, whatever, seven different alternatives to be introduced into like a document, for example, you know, you'll never build that monorail or whatever, but you're just going to entertain it because you got the political pressure to do it. But then you put that type of idea in people's heads that it could actually be evaluated. And it really creates noise in the project and gets the project to lose focus on the problems that you're actually trying to solve with the alternatives. So I think there's just a better way to tee up a project and do that more appropriate and, and, and try your best. And everyone on this panel will probably laugh when I say try to get the politics out of it as much as possible, but try your best to, to really get the noise out in the beginning and, and be genuine about what you want to actually evaluate the problem, the purpose and need that you're trying to solve with, with the infrastructure project and, and move from there. Excellent. There's so much in all of these comments that I do. Um, Paul, I'd love to hear your comments too now. Um, from, uh, you said the, the Canadian and, and really the Ontario perspective here. Um, so I know you all have uh, dealt with a lot of these same challenges, um, you know, just to the north of us. So what, I guess can you speak a little bit more to that in your words, but then also you've um, implemented within the last um, let's see, uh, 20 years or so um, a kind of new approach. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you all have been <laughs> Yeah, and it wasn't so much our, our approach as, as that of the provincial government. So um, we were actually, you know, listening to the some of the uh, anecdotes and, and uh, experience from the other panel members. I think we're quite fortunate here in the province of Ontario. Um, and any major infrastructure um, project in Ontario is really governed by uh, on the province of Ontario laws, the Environmental Assessment Act in Ontario. Um, we do also have to clear federal uh, environmental assessment regulations and, and the uh, federal EA Act, but only if, if something of federal interest is triggered. Um, one of those could be um, federal funding. If, if federal funding is involved in the project, then we need to um, clear uh, the federal EA process as well. Uh, but generally, whatever we've first done as part of the provincial EA approval, uh, generally works for, for the federal government as well, and there's not too much additional work required. Um, when we started this, this journey in, uh, towards implementing rapid transit in, Ontario, in York Region uh, 20 years ago, um, there was no special provisions under the Ontario uh, EA Act for transit projects, so it meant that we had to go through a full individual environmental assessment uh, for, for uh, every project, and it was uh, quite onerous, quite time consuming um, and expensive. Uh, we spent a lot of money on consultants. Um, uh, due to sort of our lobbying as well as other transit agencies uh, within Ontario um, asking for a, a more streamlined process for, for transit uh, projects to, to recognize the inherent value of a, of a transit project uh, versus a road widening or a new highway. Um, the, the province did respond uh, about 13 or 14 years ago and created a, a very streamlined process and it's referred to as um, uh, with the acronym TPAP, which stands for Transit Project Assessment Process. Um, and I believe somebody was going to be able to, to put the, uh, the link if anybody's interested uh, into the chat box. Um, if it's not there, you can, just, um, you can just Google Ontario TPAP process and look for a uh, for the government link under Ontario.ca uh, that describes the whole process. Um, uh, but they boiled it all down to just a six month process, um, which is extremely quick. Um, and what it really means is uh, all of your evaluation of alternatives, all of your analysis, uh, your consultation on, on those alternatives and on the project, you really need to do upfront um, before you as the proponent pull that trigger and say, I want to start that hundred or that six month process going. Because uh, once you start it, the clock is ticking and, and it's very prescribed. So um, uh, 
once you uh, issue your notice of project, um, you have 120 days to complete the actual documentation. So uh, complete any uh, final public consultation, uh, complete uh, any other stakeholder consultation, uh, complete your evaluation and all of your documentation into an environmental uh, project report, an EPR, um, which then at the end of that 120 days, uh, you post on public record. Uh, the public has exactly 30 days uh, to then issue any comments or objections to, to your EA. Um, at the end of 30 days, uh, all of that uh, information goes to the province um, and the minister um, himself or herself, uh, the minister of, of the environment in Ontario would be the, I guess, equivalent of a, a secretary of the environment in, in, uh, in the U.S. Um, they have 35 days to issue uh, a notice on, on that project. If, if uh, he or she does not issue a notice within 35 days, the project is deemed to be approved and, and uh, is good to go, can uh, be implemented. Um, if the minister does give notice, that notice can be that the project can proceed. Uh, it can proceed subject to certain conditions that you have to fulfill, uh, or they can decide that it uh, needs additional work and refer it back. Um, but, but that 35 day uh, period there for the government to make a decision is extremely critical. And I know that um, uh, my colleagues um, in, in other areas of in infrastructure um, are frustrated that they don't have the advantage of a similar process. In New York region, we've got a, a large wastewater project, a large uh, sewer project that has been frustrated for years. Um, and uh, there is no equivalent process in, in, in that case. So, so for us now, it's, it's um, an extremely streamlined and, and valuable process. Excellent. Okay, so let's um, start getting into how some of these ideas maybe all, um, you know, connect and and uh, get you all talking kind of with each other. So I'd love to pick up on um, first, I guess, the theme of um, collaborating between agencies or between different levels of government and doing it early in the process. So um, maybe, um, Felicia, I think maybe I'll start with you on this because you, you talked about the role um, in some of the new proposals that have come up on collaborating between um, different agencies. Can you talk about those in a bit more detail? And um, if anyone else wants to jump in as well, please do. Uh, yeah, sure. I can I can speak on that a little bit. Um, I, I guess from, from our perspective, like um, we've had some engaged conversations with um, our uh, with housing and urban development uh, where there are programs that may overlap or align um, particularly in the space of uh, advancing uh, transit oriented development needs as they align with affordable housing that is uh, coming out of hud um, and so that's an, one example um, on the collaboration that's happening as well as with um EPA, there's also ongoing discussions, particularly in this space as it relates to equity um, and Justice 40 and some of the analysis that and information that EPA ha has in houses as, and even on um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and some of the work that they've done and um, what some of the estimates they have as it relates to transportation and public transit specifically with respect to um, our contribution to uh, greenhouse gas emissions as it stands today and how do we move towards uh, the biden harris administration goals that they have has they've set for the country nationwide on getting at 50 percent reduction by of ghd by 2030 and 100 percent reduction by 2050 um so um oh, excuse me or zero emissions by uh 2050 so that is that's where those conversations are happening many of them are uh not just at a very high level but um we've had uh technical expert engaged conversations across the department with those agencies and even within the department we've had um we've talked about ways with our partner for example uh, the federal railroad administration we've had ongoing discussions in as it relates to uh, our major for our major infrastructure projects them having to when they're going through whether it's the environmental review process or, or other components to get to um, a grant award on a particular project where they're seeking federal funds and they're both rail and public transit elements built into how do we streamline 
our collaborations such that while statutorily we may have individually separate and and some and many times different requirements, how do we align those review processes in a way that for project specific needs and hit, trying to hit um, major milestones, how do we do that and and have efficient decision making? Um, so those are discussions we've we had we've had success um, in my time here at FTA. We had success. Um, uh, end of last year on a project uh, in the Northeast region uh, where we had a joint, a joint railroad and public transit effort where we really had to get together and talk about what we were going to do in advance to to work through things like build a, um, a Buy America and, and, and different requirements like that so that by the time uh, both not just FTA's uh, grant award was made, but also FRA's uh, financial commitment decisions aligned in a, such a way that still allowed for the project sponsor to then, they had, of course, their goal of getting out to the industry to bid and things like that. Um, and so how do we align all those decisions? And we were successful in doing that. Uh, so we've leveraged that, that experience um, at the headquarters level so that we can uh, ensure that that feeds into some of the other um, huge, large projects we have coming down the pipeline. Um, one, I, I, will, I do want to also on the collaboration piece touch on something that Amanda mentioned um, because I, I, I will. There is, we definitely see the value of early planning for upfront, and and I'll also just add that. Um, your the development of your purpose and need statement in the environmental documents that can make or break a project. We've all seen it. We've all experienced it. Um, planning and environmental linkages is something that FTA has been definitely trying to encourage transit agencies to do. We don't see it a lot. Um, it's not something that we pick up because it doesn't come natural to make some of some of the early decisions that can be made. It seems a little foreign when you're trying to. You're like, wait, I'm not. I haven't. I haven't initiated the environmental review process, so why would I be eliminating some alternatives and doing high, some high-level documentation? But there, there's opportunities there in that collaboration to leverage it that I know we've been pushing and promoting. Um, and I also would encourage, particularly for in the role that um, agencies like Transurban is with, that you're in with a P3 um, or even those large, because uh, I've seen it at the state DOT, a large transit agency level, those interagency type of um, working groups that you can establish so that, because I could see how stressful the decision to meet with um, one federal agency for one permit and and how that time, I know how that time adds up. And sometimes getting them all in one room and saying, this is the process we're going to use. This is the project. Unless uh, everyone commit to your 30 days is all going to overlap. It's not going to be disjointed in a way. And that, but that, but to your point, it takes early planning and collaboration to get to that agreement and decision. And it's not always easy, um, particularly because of the role a P3 would be in. It's, it's very unique um, in trying to, to navigate those relationships. Uh, but I, I do think that that collaboration can happen if if the, the relationships are established early such that the right partners are in agreement that, no, we see we don't want to repeat this bad mistake again because the, it does delay the project. It does, and delays just add cost. Um, so that those that's what I would add on the, the collaboration piece, Brianna. Thank you. And one thing, one thing, just to to tag on to that, Felicia is, you know, I'll come at it from a more of a tactical perspective as well, where I've had a lot of success and actually just physically getting different people together in one room and and actually on the project itself there are generally certain things or different situations that the you know the visualization of that it speaks volumes you can send as many letters as you want and get buy-in but i've had experiences where unless you're like boots on the ground out there with the teams i have held you know, field trips with joint agencies between EPA and CORE and the local um, environmental authority. I have stood out on numerous park service sites uh, looking at visual impacts. I have stood over archaeological sites debating on putting a road in a wetland versus impacting an intact arch archaeological site. But until you actually get the people tactically out there to actually see the challenges, um, and, and also get them to understand that what you're trying to fit in there is a system that has its own set of standards. So 
yes, you know, I can't build a 10 foot lane and be able to safely move freight or buses because buses mirrors are much wider. So I have to have a 12 foot lane for my bus. And you have to bring that full circle. You can't expect somebody at the park service to respect what Ashto Green Book requires you to do in a, in a surface transportation design. And you can't expect somebody at the natural resource level with their expertise to, to understand that either. So I think some of the collaboration has to be very tactical, but I couldn't agree more about um, you uh, latching onto that purpose and ease statement too, because unless you get consensus around the problem that you're trying to solve, it's very hard to, like I said earlier, get the noise out of the project. No, you're right. You're giving me flashbacks of my first, my few first field visits before establishing a purpose needs statement. and be like, we're, we're meeting in the field, people. <laughs> we're not meeting in the office. Everybody put your boots on and let's go. <laughs> so. it, I, I was going to add as well from, from our experience, even with the streamlined process, that uh, collaboration, Felicia, that you're talking about um, is still essential in the, in the process because there's still an opportunity during that uh um, a period when anybody can comment and object to your project if you haven't uh, done that collaboration and consultation with all affected agencies and stakeholders um, and brought them along with you throughout the whole process and ensured that they had all the information that they needed um, and answered all the questions that they had. Um, there, there's still an opportunity for them to object and for the minister then to send you back to, to square one. Um, so the communications and consultation is is absolutely key and critical um, in in getting your approval. Um, as a proponent, it's it's often too easy to just blame you know senior levels of government that you know it's their fault, it's the province's fault, or it's the federal government's fault um, when you haven't done you know a good enough job yourself in identifying the project, assessing all the alternatives, identifying all the impacts, and doing whatever you can to mitigate those those impacts. Um, so. That's still key, even if you've got a streamlined process um, uh, available to you. Can I just ask, I mean, how do you, how does a project proponent who maybe is not familiar with all these different entities that have to collaborate have the power really to bring them to the table to collaborate? Because to me, that's always the challenge. How do you, how do you on the outside bring the inside together mm -hmm. when it seems to me to be the primary <laughs> job of the inside to coordinate itself <laughs> well yeah here in ontario those those agencies can be um, um somewhat uh, disaggregated they're not all within the provincial government some of them are and some of them sit outside of the provincial government um so we have no power to bring them to the table it's it's through uh you know, offering them a coffee or a free lunch uh, when we can meet in person, or uh, it's it's uh, you know just through um, um, through goodwill uh, that we get that collaboration. And and I think when they can see that you're genuine in listening to them, um, those uh, people, those agencies are more likely to to then come to the table if they generally feel that they they have a voice and they're being heard and their concerns are being listened to. Then uh, uh, versus another agency where, um, or, you know, another proponent that may not be taking that approach and, and trying to just decide on a project and defend it to them, you know, people pick up on that uh, pretty quickly that you're not really listening, you're just trying to defend and get your project approved. Um, you're not really listening to what my concerns are. Right? If I could, could I ask maybe Ethan a question too, because we talk about reform and one thing um, that is a continual challenge, even on the operation side of things, is this notion of how to calculate greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> and the fact that the idea that each individual state has a different kind of oversight of that, then there's the federal level, there's a few layers in there. Um, and oftentimes in the NEPA process, you're looking at it more qualitatively because of a regional air quality conformity, but that's really not good anymore. That's good, not good enough anymore based on where we're shifting with climate change. So now there's this idea uh, or notion of wanting to understand how to calculate greenhouse gas. And I am finding, at least through practice, that not everyone is doing it the same. Um, so you said something about transferring to looking at VMT, and I just thought maybe I would ask you about that. 
Yeah, I think it's, it's an important issue. And, you know, when we first started looking at greenhouse gas emissions in, in California, uh, you know, you, you had a lot of pushback and a lot of different approaches. I mean, you had people saying, look, I'm, you know, I'm, work, I'm trying to get entitled to an apartment building in Anaheim. What, what does this have to do with, you know, a global climate change problem? And so what ultimately happened in California was that we legislated how to look at uh, greenhouse gas emissions under under our California Environmental Quality Act. And that really, I think, solved the issue um, in terms of, uh, and so I think, you know, probably we would need some kind of, you know, federal guidelines. So uh, Christy, I think looks like she disappeared from the chat, but, uh, but, but you know, some kind of guideline perhaps from CEQ about how to undertake that uh, quantification, what the methodology should be. Um, you know, we probably would need a national standard similar to how we needed a statewide standard uh, in California to address it. Um, and then uh, in terms of the vehicle miles traveled approach, you know, it's done regionally uh, by each metropolitan uh, region, uh, metropolitan planning organizations, you know, throughout California that essentially ha do that work now to, to calculate where are their low VMT areas and where are their you know, higher VMT areas, areas that are higher in VMT. That's where it's presumed that, you know, that, that if a project comes in, it's going to have a significant impact on transportation, or at least there has to be a justification as to why it doesn't. Whereas in a lower VMT area, there's a presumption that uh, that a project would be exempt. Um, but we've actually found that the VMT analysis has been so far pretty much off the shelf. In a lot of ways, it's much more straightforward to do a VMT analysis than to do the old uh, auto delay uh, calculations, you know, which required expensive consultants, things like that. Um, but now with VMT, a lot of these uses, it's almost off the shelf, you know, with the different databases out there about VMT impacts and with the maps. So we do have a statewide sort of approach to VMT as well, which which I think has helped with the quantification. Well, gosh, I, I would love to get more into this climate change topic. Maybe it's something if, if any of you or um, if, uh, you know, there's opportunity during the, the networking session after this, we can get into more detail. But um, I do want to address this. Eric in the audience has a question. Maybe this one, Amanda, if you um, are able to address this first or if anybody else has thoughts. Um, the question is, do you have any ideas on how within the current regulations there could be stronger federal guidance on what constitutes reasonable alternatives and how to evaluate them? particularly geared toward engaging or sorry, encouraging project sponsors to evaluate operational improvements alongside infrastructure ones. So for example, improving train dispatching versus expanding a terminal. Um, sure, I mean, I can take a stab at it and then Felicia, happy to have you jump in on this one too. But um, I think that one of the points I was getting at is that, alter that you know, there's generally um, when you're looking at trying to solve a problem is identified in your purpose and need a particular set of issues. Oftentimes everyone's throwing the kitchen sink at it because they feel like that is why NEPA was set up and you have to evaluate all reasonable alternatives. That's what the reg says. And even if it was like flying cars, we better look at it. And, and really it gets a little bit more basic than that because we've been able to accomplish major infrastructure projects, um, by just actually doing an environmental assessment where you're testing significance. And oftentimes people don't understand even they, they, they hear EIS environmental impact statement and they feel like that's the one I want. It's the big document. It's multiple chapters, 12, you know, appendices. That's the analysis that we need to understand if they can do it. And really, if you um, take a look at how you tee up the problem that you're trying to solve is you could look at multiple alternatives under an environmental assessment process because you're testing the significance of what that actually would be. And I think that that sometimes actually has a little bit more rigor, yet not in volumes and sizes, but it has a little bit more rigor in actually trying to solve the solution rather than introducing a bunch of other alternatives that really dilute the initial, um, the initial, uh, transportation solution that you're trying to solve in the first place. So, so that's where, that's where I feel you can, you can really whittle down the amount of alternatives to, you know, a handful. Um, I have done many successful projects just doing a build and no build. Um, do we do this project or not? Um, and weighing the outcomes. I mean, a lot of the other, the other outcomes comparative to the problem you're trying to solve becomes quite obvious. And then there's other things, obviously, that you can layer into it and accomplish, like you can accomplish outside of 
um, the actual transportation solution that you're trying to solve through implementation of bike and pedestrian mobility. There's other things that you can actually put within the footprint that's an ancillary benefit to the overall thing, but you shouldn't evaluate it as it's equal to what you're trying to actually um, build as your project. Hopefully that answers it. I don't know, Felicia, if you have anything to add to that. Final thoughts. Um, I would just add that, um, you know, you you can, I had mentioned the planning, planning and environmental linkages process, and that allows you, if you're doing, whether that's a air quality analysis, some environmental analysis at the planning level, you can incorporate that into your NEPA documentation rather than having to repeat that analysis or do it differently. And, and also do, uh, eliminate some alternatives in that process. Um, so we don't have a lot of time, but there, there are ways to get at streamlining that so you don't have to repeat yourself um, early, later on. If I can just add, uh, part of that TPAP process in Ontario um, included a list of things that are sort of automatically approved and you don't need to go through um, any kind of an environmental assessment. So in this case, expanding the maintenance facility, you would only have to go through that EA process if you are affecting an adjacent sensitive land use. So if you're affecting a, like a wetland or you're affecting a, an adjacent residential area, then you would have to go through it. Um, um, versus um, versus if you're in the middle of an industrial area and nobody really cares. Um, so uh, uh, you should, if there is any attempt to streamline a process, you should look at activities that could be streamlined, you know, right out of the, the whole EA permitting process. Excellent. Well, I um, am afraid we are out of time. We've really only touched the tip of the iceberg here, but this was a, a wonderful conversation. Thanks to all the panelists and thanks to our audience for, um, for tuning in. And um, we'll leave it at that. Uh, just a reminder, the networking sessions are, are probably underway already. So feel free to head over there if you're interested in more discussion. Thank you all. Thank you very much.